It's spoiler in time, folks, and we are going to talk about the penultimate episode of Deadwood, episode 11 of season three. We're going to talk about season four, episodes four and five of Better Call Saul. And Brian has watched most of The Good Place, so we're going to talk about all of season one up through the Trolley Problem episode, the fifth episode if you're looking at Hulu and Netflix. But Tom Merritt here saying Brian Brushwood. What should we do first? I mean, I, I guess uh, just just play the sounder. We'll we'll peek in on the movie draft. There's nothing to report. <laughs> it's all. Let's visit the grave of the summer movie draft 2018. We have 11 days left until the official season end. Nothing is going to change. This we is... even have a controversy that apparently no one cares about, <laughs> which is that a movie called Replicas is still on the list. It was owned by Cord Killers, and it didn't come out. But no one noticed because it wouldn't matter. Because it wouldn't matter. Like, this is the equivalent of the last uh, three minutes of a sports game, and it's yeah. starting to rain, and everybody's trying to beat the traffic, and they all know because the score is 72 to 5, who's going to win. And, oh, there's a flag on the field? Nobody cares because we're already trying to get home. So uh, the answer is, and specifically the question was, how do we handle this in our own personal movie league? And the answer is, uh, we don't know. Uh, we know that our league turned out such that it's not worth the attention to put into it. But I do know that usually we have a commissioner that whenever a movie gets substituted or doesn't come out or whatever, uh, the commissioner just makes a final call. It's like, okay, this is the highest value closest to that release yeah. window thing I can think usually of. Usually what happens is the person who owns the movie says, hey, wait a minute. This movie I bought isn't coming out. You need to give me another movie. And then that's what I Right. But 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 in space, nobody can hear you complain. So <laughs> it's not a problem. I mean, guys, yeah, I think Replicas Belongo and Christy were like, you know what? We just don't even want to think $700 about it. $700 million? Dollars? Wouldn't that be great if Replicas did make $700 million? It's got Keanu no, in it. If, if there was a movie for $700 million, like we would actually like that to replace Replicas, please. And now we win the movie draft. Thank you. Right. Oh, man. All right. Let's start off talking about The Good Place. Brian, so what finally got you to, to try watching this? To because be honest. As we've talked about before, I watched the first few episodes and liked it but didn't love it, kind of fell off. I was hearing so many good things, I went back and forced myself to watch a few more and got sucked in. Yeah, and and to be honest, it was just a confluence of schedules. Uh, I went out to Hollywood. Oh, we didn't even talk about this. Here's a little bit of hot gossip. Uh, did I tell you that I had lunch with Bob Odenkirk? Oh no, sh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, keep in mind when I say with, I mean by location. He was a few seats over oh, when we walked okay. into the sushi place and sat you down. You had lunch with Bob Odenkirk like I saw the King's Speech with George Lucas. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Gotcha. <laughs> I had lunch alongside Bob Odenkirk. Uh -huh. Might be a little yeah. more correct. And and I'm not, I, I didn't bother to look at photos but I, I was like, is that Andy Dick with him? And then, uh, it, which made sense because he, of course, has worked with Andy Dick and they, right. they so worked together. We should have saved this for the Better Call Saul part. But none of this has to do with The Good Place. That's correct. How, how does it relate to watching The Good Place? Well, because I did a whole day of pitching a TV uh, series and uh, we ended up, uh, it's just emotionally exhausting by the time it's all over. And I just didn't want to go out. I didn't want to see anyone. I didn't want to do anything. Even, even the siren song of Hearthstone did not call to me. I was wow. like, I want... And I started watching Ozark and I'm like, even this feels like too much too work. Yeah. And then and then I saw The Good Place. And I was like, the whole world is telling me to watch The Good Place. Bleep, blop, blop. And then uh, sure enough, you know, like uh, 20 minutes was over. I was like, man, that was that was pretty clever. That was that was smarter than I expected. And then I hit another one and another and another. And around episode six, you realize this is fiendishly clever. This mm -hmm. is this is somebody began with the ending in mind and is uh, my respect just got higher and higher. By the time we got to the middle of season two, specifically, let's let's jump all the way to the, the trolley problem mm. by the time. And we'll talk about how we get here in, in a moment. But but mid season in season two, it's you have all the characters that we care about that um uh, and, and basically all they're doing is is going on wacky adventures, only they're philosophical thought experiments yeah. uh, each time. And I realized at the trolley problem that it was like, this could progress nowhere 
and this is the show just as it is right now, and they could do 20 seasons of this, and I would love it. It would be like Radio Lab, the 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 the, the comedy, right? Yeah. Where it's just like, uh, uh, yeah, heavily visualize all this, make it real, uh, drive home the points. Uh, let me let me remember names like Emmanuel Kant, and I'm good. That is fantastic. Well, and the be one of the best parts of it is having Chidi as the character who represents everything you hate about philosophy. I am a philosophy minor. I love philosophy. But a lot of the people that I studied with, I did not necessarily find as my soulmates uh, in, in academia. And having that really kind of helps you over that burden of like, really, we're going to talk about Kant? We're going to talk about ethics? We're going to talk about Schlegel? And it's like, yeah. And everybody's going to make all the jokes to Chidi that you would make about this while still following the thought patterns of it. And 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 I, I hate to keep going right to the trolley problem, but that is that is the pinnacle episode it, it, of it, that it is the aspect of this series, because we've had the trolley problem discussion on DTNS with listeners because it has to do with self-driving cars. And when you're like, well, OK, let's actually get in a trolley and make it real. Now what? That's amazing. So. Separate from that, I, I did feel like I, I mean, I guess I guess we're in spoiler in time, so I'll speak freely. Um, I, I had read No Exit uh, by Sartre in uh, high school. So as a result, I smelled a good episode or two ahead of time uh, Wait, near the end of season one is other people yeah right where, where all of a sudden you start to realize like oh wait there's only four characters and each one wants to this sounds familiar and uh I would never say that reading a predecessor to a work of art should ruin a piece of art, but I do feel like I, I was, I don't want to say robbed, but I, I did not experience the delight and surprise at the end of season one that I might have similar to how spoiler alert uh, for, for, if you have not watched the arrival, I read slider slaughterhouse five before the arrival. And that primed me in a way that I was denied the surprise of, of the arrival. Well, I read, the story of your life before the arrival, which is the short story. It's well, okay. Time. Well, yes, <laughs> you but, know, but yeah. So I, but, but, but I know what you mean. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, so at any in rate, fact, actually, I think, I think what you feel is more disappointing because if you've read source material, you don't expect to be surprised. Right. Correct. Whereas if you've only read slaughterhouse five, you're like, Oh wait, I bet this, you know, Oh yes. wait, this is no exit. Then suddenly you, some people love that because they feel like I cracked the code, but I think your reaction is very common as well, if not the most common, which is like, oh, I cracked the code. You didn't surprise me. Well, and and, and that's not an indictment on their storytelling efforts. Mm -hmm. That's an indictment of, of like, for example, at Halloween Horror Nights, I love doing the haunted houses. But after you go for three years, you figure out that there are a few optical tricks they use. And then once you see a long hallway that you're looking down with something engaging, you know that secretly that's a mirror and that they're really behind you, you know? I, th I think that, a good place is not meant for philosophers. I don't think it's a, a TV show that's that's meant for people who who have read No Exit. I think it's doing some in jokes for those of us who have right uh, who uh, who know about the works of Kant. Uh, but it's mostly for people who haven't to say, "Hey, we're going to expose you to the concepts of these ideas in a way that will be enjoyable for you, rather than the way they would normally do it in a classroom setting." Well, and plus, also, you want to talk about a rich tapestry? They've had what three thousand years of of pre writing, <laughs> like like yeah, they've right. had a hell of a focus group put together some amazing pitches for this show, <laughs> and yeah, they've yeah. got a rich tapestry to select from. Uh, so, having said that, I just adore the way everything peels back like an onion and i loved the fact that at the end of season one you know on the one hand it's like if you smell it coming then it's like okay yeah that's a bit on the nose that they're not in the good place it's the bad place um but more importantly the ballsiness of the next three episodes as they start season two and they're all like no all memories are wiped Everybody you spent a season establishing as a character in your mind, those characters are dead and gone, literally dead and gone. And instead, 
only their archetypes remain. So like, 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 like now you only know Eleanor as what she represents. You only know Chidi as what he represents or whatever. And they're going to be used as just pawns constantly reset. And for three episodes, we're only going to follow one character arc. And that's going to be Michael, a, a supernatural a demon angel, you know? And, and uh, I was like, and Who's trying to save his project uh, for the, for the monkey mucks upstairs. So he doesn't lose it. And three episodes was just about the perfect length of time for that because I, it was long enough for me to dive into it. But I was like, man, if you're going to rob me of any emotional anchors to hold on to, I can't hold on to Michael cause I don't like him now that I know what he is and, and everybody else is constantly being reset. I don't want to hang on to any of them. Uh, and, and of course, Janet is constantly being reset or whatever, but, but instead they get just far enough that they make a credible reason for why Michael would join. It's like Michael suddenly was the Danny DeVito of the always mm. sunny in Philadelphia crew. He's yeah, like, yeah. okay, I'm the wild card. I'm the wildest wild card in the bunch. And I'm now on you on the part of the gang. And then once that happened, I feel like they took us through all the perfect opening exercises. And I feel mentally, psychologically and emotionally limbered up and Every episode could be like the trolley problem forever and ever and ever. I just want to watch these five goofballs explore all of moral philosophy with the ability to on a holodeck, basically, for all time. I I think the reason I loved the twist in season one wasn't the surprise. It wasn't that I didn't already suspect, like, maybe this is the bad place. It was that they just went there. The fact that I was like, you know, it would be funny as if this was no accident, you know, and but I still did not at that point have the confidence in the show. I felt like the show was and I think this is why I dropped off as I'm like, OK, so this show is going to be bad people accidentally in a good place. And can they be redeemed? And they'll drag that out. And so when they did it, when they ripped the band and they're like, nah, the fact that they not only did it, but they did it in a way that they were like Ted Danson's like, ha 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 five. You figured it out. Uh, just made me like, oh my gosh, they, this is more interesting. This is an interesting show that's willing to go places that I don't necessarily think it's going to go. And, uh, and, and, and so I'm very curious from, from that point on, I was very curious what we were going to do. And then the memory wipe thing too, again, maybe not unpredictable or surprising, but like you said, incredibly risky in storytelling to go, actually, we're going to strip away most of what you know and like about these characters uh, and see if we can still get away with it. Plus, also, it did a reverse Lost, because you remember in Lost, you knew that there was a few characters that you knew and loved. And uh, but there was a vague amorphous pool of anybody else who might be your next new favorite character or might die in the middle of the next episode or whatever. They undo all of that. And instead, everybody else is like in on the joke, bad people gag, except for uh, Vicky is the only one of the of the bad people, whatever, that they're sort of setting up as now the anti Michael or at, at this point, uh, mid season two. Uh, I got to tell you, I just adore everything about it. It's so very, very addictive. Um, Bryce, uh, is there anything that we missed that, that you wanted to chime in on? Um, oh, man, anything that we missed? There, there. What, what is really great about the Good Place, beyond all of the literary and 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 uh, philosophical questions, is as a piece of comedy, it's incredibly dense and incredibly fast paced. Um, I know when season two was airing and a lot of these episodes were coming out, especially the, the early ones where they're going through a lot of reboots over and over again. Right. Uh, some of the writers on Twitter were sharing like the hundreds of store name puns that they had made for all of the backgrounds, you know, in, in the different reboots, all the food based puns. Um, it's, it's, it's dense. And you you fast, do get you know? the sense that you are drinking from a comedy fire hose. Like, right. like at any given time you could press pause and find three hidden jokes. Cause I know that there are references. I, I think Tom, it was you that told me that canonically this show is in the parks and recreation universe. Is that right? <laughs> Oh, I don't. That wasn't me. Is oh, that true? Oh, someone was telling you that you were saying that over the weekend because there's a there's an ad in a magazine for the perfume from Parks and Rec. Correct. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Like like uh, like all of these little <laughs> hidden things. Oh, doggone it! I forget who it was. Uh, that's great. Right. But it's, uh, it, it's really great, and you know there are not a lot of like a cast like an ensemble comedy like this. You have to have 
the right characters and the right actors and the right concept. And The Good Place has all three in spades. Yeah, so we are basically with a core five characters, six if you add Janet, seven if you add evil Michael, a.k.a. Vicky. Uh, and then outside of that, you have sort of an amorphous cloud of, you know, occasionals. Sure, you have and background I, characters. Like that, that, that feels just about right to me, right? It, it, it seems close yeah. to Always Sunny in Philadelphia, you know, that, that, that core level. Sure. Though though I would say it's, it's a, I think the premise, you have, you have good characters, but I don't know that you have a premise that would last 10 seasons the same way that, and it's, it's like an Always Sunny would. Well, um, keep in mind, like, like for I'm now. assuming, and maybe this happens in season two, we'll get caught up. Please don't raise your eyebrows if I stumble into this, but uh -huh. I got to assume, you know, we went from the good place. We visited the medium place. Uh, my guess is there's enough room for us to visit the bad place and for us to go down to earth as ghosts for a season, you know, to see how the real world goes on without us. And, you know, then maybe what about other planets? What about alien civilizations? I mean, it's like, I, I feel like well, there's a I lot think that's of places about the for us to go. I I don't know. I feel like you reached the end of where, what I think would be pre jumping the shark. You know, yeah, I, I would agree if Always Sunny in Philadelphia were, weren't still so good. Ten seasons. But, in. But, but, but I guess my point is like Always Sunny has a very set concept and it's, it's a concept that there's a lot of room to play in. And looking at like, especially season one of The Good Place, right? You could have taken that concept of like, oh, I'm in The Good Place, but I feel like I don't belong. Like you could have stretched that out over multiple seasons. And the speed of this is really fast. So, yes. so it, it's a show that I would, I'd rather like wrap up than go eight or nine seasons like an office, like a Parks and Rec. Man, it's just that- I mean, have... I say that, uh, you, you say that, Bryce, and I agree with you right now, mm -hmm. but- I felt that way in season one where it's like, oh, okay, I know what they're going to do. And they surprised me and did something that I didn't think they could do. And then they go to another, you know, like, oh, and now we're going to wipe their memories. And, you know, if I'm not, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying I can no. see how they would do it, but maybe they're able to just keep pulling that trick off. Well, and, That's and, true, and, keep, I felt that way after keep, season keep one. Keep in mind, because I could watch one whole season on the ethics of artificial intelligence. I could see 10, 15 episodes of that, right? I could see uh, 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 the, uh, the ethics, a season on the ethics of animal intelligence. I could see a season on uh, the ethics of, um, uh, you know, just a whole thing on what is the truth or lying or whatever. Like, like, there's a lot of room to. This is a very big map that we're downloading on this on this property. I guess so. All right, let's move on to Better Call Saul, uh, which kept on trucking even if we didn't have an episode. Uh, they came out with a Labor Day episode here in the U.S., so episodes four and five of season four we'll be discussing, uh, and uh, and of course the most recent episode here is the one. Uh, where we start, I, and I want to jump right to the four, the fifth episode because we start with a Breaking Bad era opening sequence. But it, in, it, instead of usually, we just we only we only get flash forwards at the beginning of a season at the end. Uh, and here we were in the middle. We got a flash we get, middle. We got a flash middle. Yeah, <laughs> we didn't flash forward necessarily. Just. Flash to the middle of the story as as we understand everything. Now that scene was not in Breaking Bad, right? That was correct. Probably the end. I felt of like there was maybe an element of that scene that had been in Breaking Bad, either by illusion or maybe just showing yeah. him breaking phones or something. But yeah, not that full whole sequence. Yeah, that whole sequence. Man, wouldn't that be interesting? Here's uh, if you're going to place your bet, Tom. Would you bet? That that scene, because I agree, there definitely was a scene where, you know, they're shredding documents and having the conversation. Did we see an extended outtake from oh. that previous shot or, or did we see maybe. new stuff that they shot to tell that part of the story? Because that's, I would that's like the, to find that out. That's the title graphics or those are all outtakes that they shot during Breaking Bad for for the Better Call Saul commercial. So that all all of the really? graphics from the intro were from shot during Breaking Bad. Oh shoot! So we have a precedent of them. I did. I did not I know that possible. about the title sequence. Yeah. Uh, that's great. That's interesting. So yeah. Well, and and I'm sure there are going to be more tie-ins to this scene in the future. But the biggest tie-in is the phones. Like we're we're it's it's basically going. Hey, check out how many phones he's got. Remember, he's got these phones, and he makes his final call on one of these phones. That's going to be real important because here he is at the mobile store, uh, and he's he's figuring out how to make money off these phones, even though he gets mugged. Uh, and so 
phones. Just keep in mind phones because it's going to be real important. I feel like that that's the flag that we're planting in this episode. Oh, that's interesting. I took a very different angle on it. I took that um, the interesting part to me is that despite the fact that he does not need to be industrious or hardworking, he chooses to be. And that to mm, me was the real too. star. Yeah. Uh, is is that he's uh, theoretically if Saul is the lazy, selfish, smug uh, uh, piece of garbage that we think of him as, then I would imagine when he's given a one year time out, he just goofs off, you know, fig- you know, has a job, air quotes or whatever. But instead- well, yeah, because he's given the perfect gig. Right. The reason these guys who run the phone company, we're going to find out what's really going on, don't care about this store. Uh, is, is, or the reason they're not worried about this story is they figure anybody who's told like, yeah, just sit around and do whatever you want. We don't care. You don't have to sell phones is going to do that. And you're right. I, I had the, I did not think of this in relation to the opening sequence, but I did think about the fact that, wow, like he should just be relaxing. Why isn't he? Right. Well, and of course the answer is, is because he wants to make his mark on the universe. He is somebody who believes he was destined to accomplish something that was worth a damn. And whether it's as a, a male person or as a lawyer or as a, a, a cell phone salesman, he has the heart of figuring out like, OK, what am I really selling here? You know, well, it, and the other the other uh, scene that I think ties into this is when he's telling Kim about getting mugged and he says, I used to be the guy they would know not to mess with. And she says, well, you're not that guy anymore. And you can see him saying, but maybe I could be again. Right. Right. So uh, I loved that message. <sighs> like, that's straight up good marketing, good sales tactics. Like, no, you're not selling a phone, dummy. You're selling privacy, something important that that matters, that something core to you. <laughs> right. Uh, and um, <sighs> can I confess something? I I think I hate every single scene that fetishizes Breaking Bad. I think I hate every scene where underneath it is the pretext of, huh? Huh? Because later they make meth you know, in a secret underground lab over here? I know here? that stuff bothers you. I always try to approach it as if I didn't know Breaking Bad, would it bother me? Well, uh, and I have not seen too many, if any, scenes where they where I feel legitimately they would stick out if I didn't know Breaking Bad. And so I tend to just ignore them. So here's what which ones are bugging you uh, specifically. Let's take the um, there was 20 minutes of the show, give or take dedicated to Mike Ehrmantraut vets, people who say they can dig underground meth labs. Ah, right. Yeah. Um, if I'm not fanboying out over the fact that I recognize this laundromat. What am I to take from this? And the only well, lesson this- I have is that Mike Ermintrout is very careful, which I already knew. Other thing, they plan to dig an underground lab, which mm-hmm. I already knew. But there's no, you don't. nothing. If you there. don't know Breaking Bad, you don't know that. Well, OK, either way. Either way, uh, it, 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 uh, this is this lose is, lose. I but no, I I think you're letting your knowledge get in the way of your enjoyment, and maybe there's no way around that, right? That well, just may be the way it is for you. But hold, hear me out. This is perfectly legitimate scene building because we just had Mike get in trouble for doing something where he's like, I got to earn my check. So this is the answer to that. Like, fine, if you got to do something, let's have you do this. Of course, he's careful. This shows that he will continue to be extra careful with people. And the other storyline we're following is what is Fring going to do to steal away business from the Salamancas? And the thing he has to do is create production in house, which is why he went and visited his friend at the college and got those designs. This is the next step in that plan, which is I'm going to bring production in in a way that nobody knows I'm doing it. Not the cops and not the Salamancas, nobody. And this is how this is the story of Fring's rise to power, if you will. And you so you need to tell this part of the story. I I what you described sounds awesome. I wish that was the show I was watching because I am most certainly not watching Fring's Rise to Power. I wonder if you're just not you're like discounting all of the things that tell you that because you're like, but I already know that. 
No, 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 no. Uh, uh, what, what I'm, what I'm saying. Uh, first of all, if this is the story of Fring's rise to power, seems like I'd be seeing a lot more Gus Fring. Maybe some sh- solo shots. He would We've be seen a there. Lot of Gus like, Fring, though. Uh, no, 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 no. I only see him when Mike Ermintrout is there, and when... it's not a main storyline. But all right, all right, all right. Right, right. It. Your main characters are Saul Ermintrout, uh, Kim, and uh, and and uh, Nacho. And that's it. Uh, those are your four main characters. Gus Fring is a supporting role that shows up like Darth Vader from time and to time. And he always was. He was in Breaking Bad as well. That's fine. But but, but again, Ermin Trout's story hinges on Fring. We probably are going to see Saul's story hinge on Fring. And so you've got to see Fring's rise in the power happen, even if it's not the main storyline. Well, and plus also... We've seen Mike Ermintrout be vulnerable and su- and surprise us with a level of depth and caring and 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 compassion and honesty and and uh, virtuosity uh, that that we uh, I would love to see that kind of flaw that kind of honesty from Gus Fring, but we don't get that. We get a cartoon. Same thing with the Terminator twins. My least favorite characters in all Breaking Bad are friggin' the superstars of garbage. This is the the worst part of Better Call Saul. It's like, and then two Terminators come, and by the way, you never have to worry about them getting injured or hurt or anything because you definitely see them in the future for Breaking Bad. They're, it's, it's, I... Well, just want to get up and everybody. walk away. You know, everybody that's in Breaking Bad is not going to die. So at that point, you can't watch a prequel. Oh, no, 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 no. See, like, uh, this is just it. I believe I'm going to watch my, I'm going to watch Jimmy's heart break at some point and him come out as Saul Goodman. Yeah, but the ter- I don't know watch... why the Terminator guys bother you so much. They're barely in it. There, there's not, uh, not by real estate. I, uh, you know what? However much they're in it, it's too much. <laughs> How about that? All right. <laughs> um, like there's a story there about the taking down of the Salamancas, but but there I, I again it's the fetishization of, uh, of. I think you're decided it's fetishization, and now can't enjoy it. You know what it is? It just triggers all of my prequel alarm bells. Is the prequels could have been great? You've been hurt before. Well, the the prequels wasted too much time mm-hmm. trying mm-hmm. to tie things together that nobody really cared about when instead they could have told a new interesting this is, story. This is trauma. This is the definition of trauma, which is <laughs> whether it's truly a warning sign or not, it's not when you see something that looks like a warning sign to wrong. the thing that hurt you, you you will be afraid of it. This You'll is anger. Angry. We're still in anger, Tom. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying that the prequels, uh, whatever, uh, I, I, it's, <laughs> The, the the more like, oh, and this is what happened in this tiny momentary gap between blank and blank. You know, it's like that stuff I, I hate. Like I, the, I don't care the, for the guy who hears the, the typewriter sounds and thinks they sound like gunshots and just, you know, freaks out. Sorry, this is too close to home. All right. All right. All right. All uh, right. Anyway, uh, in general, still on board, but it felt uh, this felt like homework. Uh I, I enjoyed four and five both. I'm curious about that because four four I'm I'm not too far away from you. It it, it it felt a little more like homework. Five I I enjoyed the story of him out there hustling and selling the phones. That was kind of fun to watch. Yes, correct. Uh, five five was better than four. Also, uh, I don't remember if it was four or five, but uh, Hamlin uh, really breaking oh, yeah, down. That's in five, right? Yeah, that was great. That was a great scene and that moment that Hamlin almost really starts talking real with Jimmy and then realizes who he's talking to and just mm-hmm. says, you know what? That's enough. Like, uh, yeah. especially as somebody who chronically suffer, suffers from insomnia, when he says, you know, are you familiar? Mm-hmm. You know, have you, have you ever had insomnia? He's like, yeah, I don't know, there's a pill for that. And he, and he said something I've thought night after night after night, he said, I would not wish it on my worst enemy. Oof. Like, like that yeah. landed. And I felt, I felt genuine empathy uh, with Hamlin in that moment. I thought it was the the other direction is interesting as well, where Jimmy decides, you know, kind of uncomfortably, like, I guess I got to ask, are you OK? And like and then is like, well, maybe I could help. Like, I'm not sure I buy it, but Kim has this therapist. And, you know, have you seen a therapist? And then that moment when he's like, yeah, I see one every week. Yeah. And he's and still a suddenly, mess. unintentionally. Jimmy's like, oh therapists are worthless look at this guy <laughs> well oh, no no no. I, I took the opposite from him where, where he was like oh wait it's a real thing and and then and then like oh no Jim, no no i and, took it as like he was thinking you know what maybe i should because he had told her like i guess maybe i'll go to the therapist and then when he sees mcgill he's like what therapist obviously doing nothing for this guy like i didn't want to go anyway it's a waste oh that's interesting because what he says mm. is he says uh he's like oh well does 
does it work? Like all of a sudden he's really interested. Like, oh, I, I just assumed they were a, a garbage fake thing that everybody peddled to each other. So I, I wonder hmm. that's that's going to be a yeah, fun thing to ruminate about uh, yeah, to yeah. see whether because they've set up the whole therapy angle as a big thing. So I wonder if that goes anywhere. But he did rip up the the, the phone number and flush it down. Sure, the but also uh, I got the impression that well, I don't know. The phone number is written down in the phone book too. Well, yeah, yeah, or uh, I, I don't know. I, I got the impression that it landed, I made an impression on him that maybe I felt like that was the first time he ever even considered the possibility that a therapy would uh, be helpful. All right. Uh, anything else about Better Call Saul before we move along? Not that I can think what, of. Very quick, what do you guys think of Kim's pro bono? Detente? Oh, yeah. No, I'm glad you reminded me of that. I still don't understand what she's up to and why she would up, why she would threaten the Mesa Verde contract, which is her lifeline. Be I mean, I get in the moment why she would be like, no, I really want to help this young woman. But where is she going with this? Why is she doing it? I haven't quite figured that out. Is it guilt? Out. Does she feel partially Maybe. guilty for, um, for Chuck's death? I feel like there's some level of she needs to work through, uh, you know, I, I think she wants to get back. I, I think we are meant at this point to feel like she is trying to go back to core values mm -hmm. and I'm going to look for pure cases and people to defend and do my lawyer thing or whatever. But I... I suspect that what we're being teed up for is some kind of, uh, uh, oh, no, 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 she was just looking for the right case at the right time mm. for her to go on her own dark journey. Yeah, to Because yeah. to... she is still recovering from that injury. Right. And having to be in a position where she has a paralegal and is trying to now manage someone and, and show that she can still do work, good work that helps, you know, citizens. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I, uh, this reminds me, they're, they're painting the house I'm living in and they hired these guys, uh, who are real nice guys. Uh, and they're out there. I hear them talking and I catch the words, they speak in Spanish and I hear, catch the words Mesa Verde and I laugh to myself like, oh, that's funny. Mesa Verde. And then suddenly I hear Saul. Ah. And, I'm like, and they're talking about the show. No, they're actually talking in Spanish, <laughs> talking about Better Call Saul. That's like, amazing. That's right? awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that was really cool. All right. Uh, well, gentlemen. I brought a can of sliced peaches and some cinnamon, so let's uh, let's sit down and uh, do. Do you want some, Ryan? Tom, this was a very unpleasant episode of Dead. So no peaches then? No, you. Oh, you actually did. I wasn't even looking. <laughs> I was. I was lost in the episode, man. It was like I was. I was. Uh, I was back yeah. in Nam. Suddenly, no. This Deadwood's real already. It did not need to get realer, and yet they did. Uh, I felt and. Yeah, go ahead. Tell I felt me. I felt ill. Uh, this was like uh, this was like watching 9/11 unfold in Deadwood, and and everybody knew it. And they've trained us for three seasons about the layers underneath the layers, and the fact that you can see something happen and know that no, it's not instantly gonna you know kill you, but know just as well that that glacier is gonna run over your town, and and you're just as dead either way. Um, it was really unpleasant. It was really unpleasant to watch, and re which which means it's good art. You know, I mean, it was well, great. Your your comparison to nine eleven is well made. The business like manner in which uh, Ellsworth is dispatched uh, is terrifying. It's, there, it's there's not, no music. It's not Did, a big buildup. There's no like, I'm going to scare you. I'm going to come in here and give you a speech. It's a lean in Ellsworth looking, realizing what's about to happen and over like and that. There was and no I, music. I, I found that just horrifying. And then the rest of the way the episode is shot with so much silence and running around and waiting to figure out what to do next captured the semblance of any similar events that I've ever been tangentially associated with, which is there's not screaming and crying and running in tears. There's silence and confusion. And they really captured that. Yeah. And, uh, Trixie's response. Wow. Simultaneously ridiculous, mm -hmm. insane, uh, mm -hmm. uh poorly, uh, un unfounded, uh, just uh, everything wrong. Uh, and yet also hundred percent believable. Like yeah. that is exactly the kind of thing I could imagine just overwhelming somebody in that, in that. And someone going, what do I have to work with? What do I do? Uh, fine. 
And yeah. then the moment, and and plus, even in that moment, you realize, you know, you get a sense of what she's going for, and then she she pulls the trigger, and the moment you see Hurst's shoulder explode, I just felt this wave of like, uh, tell me you got another round. Tell me you got another round. Yeah. Tell me you got another Shoot round. Again. Shoot because again. Otherwise, <laughs> uh, like 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 uh, uh, otherwise, this is bad. It's really really bad. Yeah. And then and then that panic, that despair, that 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 cornered dog. Uh, you know, sense of 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 there's nothing I could do, and 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 solved nothing I could do, and all that stuff. Um, and and the doc treating, uh, treating him and forgetting to dress the wound, <laughs> like yeah, showing. It's like despite his Hippocratic oath, he's definitely being his loyalty is being pulled in a direction. He, well, he uh, he offers the greatest possible level of resistance go- Doc is able to do, which is to possibly try to get out without fully <laughs> treating the yeah, wound. With le- leaving something open to infection. Yeah. Uh, that scene at the end, though, this is what I lament is. The things we will not see because there was not a season four, but Wu's character arc, Wu knowing that he's like, oh, wow, despite all of, you know, the racist everything here, uh, you know, we are in a place now where it is up to me to save the day yeah. to come Wu in. Big man. Yes. Uh, Wu get men, 150 uh, guns. Uh, and, uh, you know, and the, and the two of them like like. No irony, no detached, you know, I'm above you or whatever. Like the two of them, just as as two men who understand that all of the rules have changed and and they're either going to get wiped out. Oh, my God. It was it was it was just great. It was great. And I liked again, as 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 patronizing as it is, he he tells all of the whores to uh, stand up as if he was any other uh, white man with money uh, to make him feel like 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 a proper man coming out of of that meeting uh and uh, you know he, he, you know he, Wu says in english which i think is a little bit weird he goes like whoa big man big man and then goes out um it was great yeah it was a little weird that he vocalized it, I, it but, I but mean, yeah but it's television you know yeah, yeah. like uh, uh they also they, they don't do subtitles i think in an alternate version of deadwood he would have said it in chinese and we would have mm-hmm. seen subtitles or yeah, something yeah yeah uh and honestly i mean knowing we're cut short even so I assume as we go into the finale, it's going to be the battle. We're going to see the battle between Hearst and the rest of the town. Uh, and 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 if if we get a battle that ends, uh, even if it doesn't end definitively, but but it but it resets the playing field, then I I'll feel pretty good. And of course, we feel even better knowing we got a movie coming. Yeah, man, man, oh man. Uh, hell of an experience really excited about the movie and i guess we got to start uh teeing up I, I mean one more week and then we're gonna start our new adventure well that's why i wanted to invite you over for some peaches at the uh, to watch the finale but <laughs> i don't like peaches i even have cinnamon we can... <laughs> all right uh i i did love that point where swearinger goes over to the hardware store and is like you know i serve peaches when i have a meeting yeah <laughs> 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 uh, thanks everybody for watching and supporting us on Patreon, patreon.com slash cord killers. You get these episodes early. Uh, you get a little extra content from Brian and Bryce and myself and whoever else we can get to hang around with us. Uh, so please continue to support, tell your friends and we will spoil you again next time. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>